his studio in Baltimore. Raul, thank you for being with us. My pleasure. Raul, you are a graduate of MICA, a graduate of Johns Hopkins University. Could you tell us about yourself a little bit and how you got into the world of art? Well, I'm not really a graduate of MICA. I've been teaching there. I just retired here for 58 years. <laughs> but I did, I did go to Saturday classes there in my teenage uh, years, maybe one year or one semester. I took Pastel there. Anyhow, I, I uh, graduated in philosophy from Hopkins in 1955. And I've always had a fantasy about the West as a kid. I read the books of uh, Will James III, books like Smokey, Lone Cowboy, All in a Day's Riding. So I hitchhiked out to Montana and worked on ranches uh, for a while as a cowhand. You know, uh, and then if I, I wandered out into California and uh, lived in New Orleans and New York uh, during the winter. And then I went back out to Montana and worked another summer. Um, and uh, I started paint. I always had an interest in drawing and I did a little uh, surreptitious painting when I was at Hopkins. <laughs> But I really was interested in being a writer, and part of my traveling around the country was like the idea, like on the road, you know, like. Uh, Jacques correct. Yeah, so I wrote a book, uh, and uh, I called it I like that. I didn't know about Carlick at the time. It was a traveling book, and I called it uh, well, the Trap because I had a girlfriend and I felt trapped by her. <laughs> and I was throwing hay bales up <laughs> to a guy in Montana, a cow hand up there, went to a stack we had out in the field, and he said, I heard you, you wrote a novel, what's the call? And I said, The Trap. And I guess he didn't hear clearly, he said, The Crap. So <laughs> I changed the title to The Hitchhike, but it was not very good, and I uh, didn't save it. I saved the chapter of it, I think. And then uh, I uh, drafted into the art. I did, I went to New Orleans for a while and um, for five or 10 bucks, I got a, a I got a, um, a, on Pirates Alley along St. Louis Cathedral in downtown, old, old French Quarter. I got a space on the wall and I did caricatures of people. In, in, on, and that was to make money. I charged 50 cents. And uh, people always would tear them up because the likenesses were not too flattering. <laughs> and so um, uh, my girlfriend at the time said, you know, we'll change the title to Mirror Maze, see how you turn out. So we tried that. People still tore it up. Mirror So, so I started mirror? off as an uglifier. Wait a minute, a mirror may. What is that? A mirror maze. Mirror maze. It's like you look in the mirror, and it's a you know it's a kind of a distorted mirror. Oh. And oh, I you see. know so that the lightness would undergo levels of uh, distortion that would be hopefully amusing, but it didn't amuse my clients, and they would tear them up. And then uh, during that time, I was drafted to make a long story short uh, into the army because they had to draft then. And uh, at first I was, uh, I was interviewed to be a spy. In other words, they had tests when you went in and about 25 of us were interviewed to be a spy. And I really wanted to be a spy Aww. because it was at Fort Hollibird and I could wear civilians and all my buddies were here in Baltimore. So it wouldn't be that dramatic a change to my lifestyle. <laughs> but. Uh, I went from, you know, we went from 25 to 5. I mean, the, uh, one interviewer had me and another guy come into the office and he, he asked me, um, yes, the other guy next to me, what's your most salient character, characteristic? And the guy said, he was my, you know, a guy like me, I drafted, he said, friendliness. So then the guy turned to me and he said, well, is he friendly? And I said, well, he's not unfriendly. Then he looked at me, scowled, he said, we don't allow no negative answers here. <laughs> so then later on, they, I was down to five, and they had a guy come down uh, from Washington, D.C. And he gave me, I was smoking, he, I smoked a cigarette, he gave me a scotch and soda. I was very relaxed, and I thought, well, I'll be, this is pretty good, this five business. 
And he asked me something about the Supreme Court and an injunction. I didn't know what that was because I never was much into politics at the time. And he asked me, how much freedom do you think you have in this country? And I said, well, uh, we got this. Is a, we got a lot of we got all the freedom. You know, this. And he said, we don't have freedom. This country, we can't afford it. You know, I don't know who he was putting me on or telling me the truth. With a country this size, we can't afford a freedom. You he know. was egging you on. Yeah, he was egging. So... I took my cigarette and drank, and it was a low stool, and I stood up on top of it, and I had my finger pointing <laughs> upward, and I said, I don't understand how people get interested in headlines in newspapers. One day says one thing, the next day something else. I said, I read Proust. I deal in eternal verities. <laughs> and that was the end of my career. So, bye. so then as I was a, became a company clerk in a railroad battalion of Fort... Fort Eustis, Virginia, and I had a hobby of going and doing art, just like once or twice a week I go to a hobby, and I fill around with watercolors or drawing or stuff, maybe some gouache painting, and uh, uh, they noted that I had talent. Now, I hadn't been to art school. I did have that pastel course maybe when, as a teenager at MICA, Maryland Institute, but that was, you know, so they cut orders for me to become an artist illustrator for the army. Oh, neat. And you know, I was a draft, I didn't want to go in, but you were a draft, I was drafted in, but the irony and blessing of the thing was, when I became, with no education, and I was not very good, you know, I mean, I couldn't do, it was like commercial, it took me a while to catch on. You know, first I did a lot of lettering, you know, Leroy lettering sets and everything and then the army sent me to art school at night at the college of william and mary and paid for it wow and that you know just as a draftee i think that's really extraordinary wow and then they had me because they saw i did paintings and i showed them portraits and this and that in my painting class and they noticed the kind of propensity i had for bringing out the ugliest features of, of, of my <laughs> sitters so they had me do uh enemy soldiers which they would cut out of wood. They had the wood chop there, and I would paint them, and they would cut them out, put wheels on them, and roll them out, as a, and tying string one enemy soldier to another in a kind of platoon of gregarious ugliness and to be shot at. They were like targets. <laughs> yeah, so, so my, now I did other things in the Army. Uh, I wound up, you know, heading Armed Forces Day at Newport News, and the parade and making whatever had to be done at that time. And it was it was a kind of interesting job. And then I got out of the Army. While I was in the Army, I met um, a gentleman who was a civilian hired by the Army named John Needry. And he and his family took me in. I would have dinner over there. We'd talk about art. He showed me art books and art history. And, and he, um, you know, he really helped, you know, guide me in a certain way. He was like uh, an apostle of uh, of knowledge, you know, was that I submitted myself to. Was he classically trained? He was trained at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. So as soon as I got out, I, uh, I mean, meanwhile, I had a show at Mardix here in Baltimore. Oh, neat. And, Let's uh, tell everybody what Mardix is. There's a little bar on uh, Mulberry Street, uh, and uh, and you had to you had to ring the doorbell, which you couldn't. Well, even then find. those days you didn't. It was open. <laughs> it was open. Later he became. Morris had a restaurant and had a doorbell, and you had to ring the bell when he had a. Re it was more closed. At that time it was very open. You just walk in, and uh, 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 me and my buddies would hang out there uh, on Saturday mornings. There would be a bunch of, or during the week, a lot of interesting artists that would be there. That would be, you know, hear him talk. They were very witty and fun to hear. And I had friends there, and uh, Morris was nice. Uh, I went with him when I had my uh, studio. This is later, but when I got out of the Army and uh, I got a place, this is a long story. I think things get mixed up, but anyhow, um, uh, I knew uh, I had a show at Morris at that time. And uh, uh, you know, it was segregated city and all, but and the army wasn't segregated. So I had a, a friend of mine, a black artist named Franklin, and I invited him to see my show. And, you know, at first it, we couldn't bring him in to see the show because, you know, the yeah. army was very open. Everybody was, but, you know, Baltimore was still a segregated city, so it was very embarrassing. But Morris finally let him come in quickly. 
And uh, at Mar that time... Mar Mar Mardix wouldn't allow you to bring the black army men... No, he felt, he, he hesitated, but I persuaded him to have him come in and see the show, but he wasn't allowed to... Have, I mean, at that time, it was, wow. a, it was a different city. Hmm. So, and, and so, uh, an artist in town had seen the show. In fact, I used to go, for, as a kid, I used to go draw with him, uh, Reuben Kramer. He had a yeah. studio, uh, and uh, he was, uh, he, I used to go draw with him at the time, and he had a drawing uh, class on the second floor on a building off of Mount Royal. One time it was locked, and I had it. He gave me a boost up onto the roof, and then I went through a window and unlocked the door. It was inadvertently locked, and I used to draw a little bit there. Did you? Did you? And did uh, you he, think? my father, uh, had him come down and see my show. Maybe this was before I actually knew him. I mean, the sequence sometimes gets mixed up, but later I became a friend of Reuben. Well, but Reuben told me I ought to go to art school, and I didn't want to go to art school, but he told me I should go to art school. And then uh, John Nedry, he encouraged me to go to art school and the Pennsylvania Academy seemed like the place. So three or four days after I got out of the army, um, I, I enrolled at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. And, um, and after the first year, I only went there for a year and a half, but the, after the first year I went to see Reuben. And Reuben uh, looked at my drawings and, and so forth. And he said, well, I make my feet too big and uh, maybe I should work from, you know, clay to sculpture so I feel more comfortable uh, doing neat. the feet. So I don't, was my, my lack of confidence in doing such a, a, a complicated articulation of human form as the foot, I would probably do better, you know, if I had modeled it in clay and then I would draw it oh, more wow. uh, relational uh, right. proportion to the rest of the drawing. So at the same time, I just learning a little bit about art history. And I said to Ruben, what do you think about Giacometti? And Ruben said, oh, Giacometti, his, his work won't last. <laughs> and, and he went up to his own sculpture and he took a huge mallet and raised himself up. And he was a powerful guy on tippy toe and came down with a sledgehammer on top of his own, on the oh head of his gosh. own sculpture. And he said, you can't do that to a Giacometti, he said. So his sculpture survived, but he didn't think a Giacometti would survive the impact of such force. Wow. Pummeling down. So then, oh, while I was in the Pennsylvania Academy, I got a scholarship to Skowhegan for the summer. Where is that? That's a, in, in Maine. Maine. In Maine, okay. And uh, I was a wiseacre, you know, and uh, a teacher, Henry Varnampour, gave me a credit, and he said, I, he says for himself, I stress the horizontal. Well, I was a wise ass, and I said, well, I strict the diagonal or something. And, you know, I gave him every, and then I stayed with Alice Katz, and, and uh, I was, you know, like, I, he, he was a guy that had Vanguard hoopla to it, and he, he uh, came out to me. I was painting a landscape. I must have been painting it for a week, struggling to get, and talk about plein air. I mean, I was struggling. That was one of my first plein air paintings. I was struggling to get the rolling hills and the, and the uh, intensity of the greens and different fields of depth. And he came over and took the biggest brush out of my box, a hardware store brush, and flattened the whole thing out. Oh my gosh. And then he said, better right. He threw the brush into the tray, walked away. Better right. And it was better, but it wasn't me. And so I had trouble, you know, uh, he saw I could draw, but he said, so what? He goes, I think I could probably draw better than him, you know. But he said, so what, you know, like, and that, so. What is, let, let, me, let me just ask you a question, because that must be very difficult if you're dealing with an ego of an artist who's also a teacher, and then an artist who, and you become a teacher, how, how does that, like, who, who tells who what to do? And, and well, that was a problem. <laughs> that was a problem. And when I got back, uh, Henry Varnum's da daughter saw me on the street in Manhattan, and I was mounting the curb across it, and she stopped me and said, you got a lot to learn, boy. And when I got back to the Pennsylvania Academy, the head of the academy said, we sent the wrong guy <laughs> to, to Scal Egan. So I left there, I went to New York, I stayed with Reuben uh, Tam, Reuben Tam, a terrific guy uh, from Hawaii, a terrific abstract landscape painter, very good. But 
my, my experience at the Pennsylvania Academy was more pertinent to what I really wanted to do. And uh, my friends there, the kind of lifestyle, the kind of, you know, the intricacy and the collegiality of the other students were in, in uh, Brooklyn. I went to Brooklyn. I, I, I switched to Brooklyn. Brooklyn Museum had an art school. And uh, at the weekends, everybody disappeared, the Queens, the Manhattan. There was nobody there. I mean, it was kind of a lonely and so I finally left there. I was on a scholarship there. So Alice Katz actually wrote and got me a scholarship there, work scholarship. And then when that was over, I got a loft in New York and started painting. And I had a part-time job, you know, messenger boy, this, that, and the other. Well, and you decided you decided to stay in New York rather than come back to Baltimore well, at, at first, that time? Yeah, at first. But then I had buddies here and they wanted to get a, a warehouse on the waterfront on Pratt Street. And they want me to join in with them. And I had some war bonds, 1875 war bonds during the Second World War, which matriculated to $25 each. And I had a bunch of them that I had as a, a young kid, you know, in school, and I never cashed them in. So I cashed them in, I had a couple hundred dollars. And I helped them buy this warehouse uh, on Pratt Street, Which 408 East Pratt. Would that have been where the Inner Harbor is now? Yeah, but it wasn't Inner Harbor then. Yeah, but, Harbor Place. But it was fascinating then, and I loved it. And and then uh, I, 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 Morris Mardik said he would bring me in to be a bartender. But uh, out of a, a fluke, I called up the Maryland Institute. I, they just hired Bud Leake. I had no degree in painting whatsoever. And I said, I think I can be of great help to the Maryland. <laughs> and so he gave me an interview. <laughs> and he and he, and I had a few paintings. I didn't have a lot, but they needed somebody because the freshman class had expanded beyond what they prepared for. So um, I think I had a class. They gave me a class. He, he told San Giambo he thought I was a little crazy, but he hired me anyhow. And... Um, and later on, Bud Leak and I became really uh, good friends. I mean, he really kind of, I think, kind of saved my life in a way from uh, penurious kind of destitution. But, uh, and I taught, and I taught it in the old B&O station. Oh, but, neat, yeah. So and there was still the nothing there. It was just a big station. Yeah. And it was, Tilden Street was teaching sculpture in the baggage room. Dick Otten Ireland was teaching upstairs on the second floor, and I had freshmen on the whole, that whole run of the station. So uh, I think I was making thirty-two dollars a week, hmm. and uh, I would go from student to student on my bicycle. I had a Aww. bicycle, and I would get. <laughs> but I had a way of teaching. You know, for some reason, uh, you have, I'm a you kind of ham. This... I'm kind of a ham. But you, you also and have I could all really this... teach in a way that came natural to me. But you also have all this excess energy, so you got to be riding back and forth right. with your bicycle. Right. <laughs> so I, 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 I kind of helped form freshman painting in a way. I, had, I started them with poster paint on just newsprint, so they didn't have to worry about the expense of canvas and canvas, you know, and 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 the, the kind of money inhibitor so that people are more free and didn't like it at first, but then then I gradually, you know, made different exercises with the throwaway stuff of just, uh, you know, poster paint and newsprint, and then moving from there into oils and canvases. So it, it worked really well for, you know, I, I had them take off their shoes, put their brushes between their toes <laughs> to get over and, and, and inhibit Because I used to teach horseback riding, you know, when, way back in my teenage years. I didn't go into that, but I worked for Jimmy Hector uh, in Old Court Road, and I taught horseback riding, and and that also at a camp. I taught horseback riding when I was 16, 17 years old in, in West Virginia, and I would take the, the kids and make them stand up on the horse, you know, when they, they were very terrified to be on a horse. So I had them stand up in the saddle, you know, just stand up so when they sat down, they weren't as frightened. So using that kind of, you know, that kind of strategy, I had them use the poster paint in a way that, you know, it didn't have the kind of, you know, fear inducing uh, kind of complexity of oil paint. And so when they got the oil paint, they were more, more uh, casual with it and able to deal with it without all that kind of frustration and, 
Well, I want to I want to bring in here um, that you have also painted horses uh, that because we have the Preakness, the Pimlico. Well, I did the murals that the Marylanders do with the students, and I love that. Uh, I love. I mean, that all goes with the Western thing that yes. I went out west, and I that's what you know. And I when I was a kid, I rode. I used to ride uh, horses for Jimmy in the mornings before school and break them in when they were, you know, some of them were very important uh, horses like Family and Sanvar and other horses. And, uh, and I rode a Pimlico in the mornings and then I rode Jumpers and it was a big deal for me riding. It was the thing I did. And I always think of painting like that. If you talk about plein air painting and the idea for me of painting was like, you know, when you're painting nature, the changing landscape, the colors of the light, the mood, you, know, you, 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 have to, you have to go fast in a way. You're in a rush because things are changing and fading and coming into being. All, it's a flux of appearances. Yep. So then uh, I found that my talent was better suited for Alla Prima painting. So when I did landscapes, uh, it's a long story how I switched from pop art to pop art, and I switched to, uh, as a, it's a long story, but I don't know how much of a long story you want to hear on this, <laughs> on this video. But anyhow, the idea of, of, um, of painting, uh, nature, uh, a la prima was the, was like the way of not only, uh, finding what was authentic, because I did all these sketches at first and didn't finish them. Kind of, I did sometimes five in an afternoon to try to find out what was real about myself before I would try to make a perfect thing of it or, or cosmeticize it or anything like that. And so I was really searching for something about myself, uh, and a, 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 an authentic kind of, uh, kind of, uh, uh, idea of myself. And this led to doing self portraits. And then they, you know, I did hundreds of self portraits. In an attempt to, I mean, the idea of self, of, of selfhood is really a very fluid thing. Even though it's always the same, it's always different. It's a great mystery. And I kind of made a record of that involving maybe thousands of self portraits and also thousands of sketches of the, the harbor, the Baltimore Harbor. And then I had a property out in Harford County near, uh, Port Deposit, across from Port Deposit along the Susquehanna River and the Deer Creek. And then my wife family had a place in Buzzards Bay, at, uh, uh, Wareham, uh, Massachusetts, and I would paint the rocks there for 40 years. So well, the idea of painting outdoors, I mean, I, it, I, I, it would be too dispiriting to try to copy nature from photographs. I, I was not, I wanted to, to, to uh, being, I mean, I'm wrestling a kind of contact, uh, a kind of a struggle with the the with the uh, the uh, shifting identity of otherness and myself to try to make a painting, a painting which I would have a concept, but then my concept would, you know, get into uh, uh, half Nelsons with the, the reality <laughs> of the nature, and the outcome would be a surprise. Uh, maybe a failure, maybe I get someplace I hadn't been before, my brushstroke would be more spontaneous because, you know, when I originally got out of art school, I was in, this is a complicated roundabout uh, kind of boomerang uh, ex uh, explanation. But when I got out of art school and I first started teaching at the Maryland Institute, I was trying to become, I was very infatuated with abstract expressionism. Expressionism, especially de Kooning, Trans Klein, even some Rothko. And then from that, I tried, I thought, well, I could do pop art. And I got involved in pop art. And I was in pop art shows for a couple of years. And then I rebelled against all that. And I, and, uh, I got disenchanted with the whole, you know, uh, swagger and, and, uh, and, uh, of the pop art world. Uh, and, and and I did I, I went against it was stupid but I went against it uh, I, I challenged went, it by painting directly from nature and that was to me the stupidest thing you could do I went out and a play I got a place in Port Jervis and I went out with my French easel I did all these sketches I you know and I was like 
you know, uh, uh, I didn't know any other landscape painter at the time. Uh, it was not the thing to do. You have to fight through flies, cow pods, and uh, the heat and humidity. And, and uh, it was uh, a real kind of a, a, a Sisyphusian thing to do. You know, it's kind of you know, it was the stupidity of it encouraged me. I mean, I wasn't doing uh, academic grad school kind of academic, you know, uh, paintings of abstract expressionism or abstraction or anything. I was doing. I was kind of retarded there, old fashioned, and somehow there was a purity in that that it, I, I wasn't. You know, I was kind of rebelling against the. I guess in New York art world to a certain extent. Well, Later on, I met painters. I joined a figurative alliance in New York. I met painters that were doing figurative stuff, but at that time, I didn't know any. And it was a radical thing to do, but it's, it's, it's backward gesture was radical. And so that's how I started. Raul, we're here in your uh, studio on North Calvert Street, a studio that you share with your wife, who is also a fellow artist. So could you tell us about your studio and then tell us about the Grimaldi's who represent you here in Baltimore? Well, um, we have a studio in the house, which is uh, part of a, a, a work. My wife is a, has a workshop, a, a printing workshop, and which means that works like etching and uh, modern prints and so forth and a different a Baltimore artist working a workshop and then we show it in a gallery uh, on the first floor, a beautiful gallery just started about several months ago, uh, but it's really, been, uh, the turnout for the different openings have been really phenomenal. And uh, the name of the gallery is called Ink Spot Press. Um, and it's, all etching. It's all work, and it's been a life dream of my wife to have a workshop. She she's uh, a very uh, variegated artist. She does sculpture, painting, this and that. But her, her primary love is like etching, and she studied etching in Paris with William Stanley Hayter at Lié de Set, you know, Studio Seventeen. And moved to New York and then went back to Paris, and. Uh, and so it's it's a great thing that just recently happened for her, a life dream. And then when I started in representation, I started showing with uh, Constantine Grimaldus. He opened a gallery in the early 70s. And at the time, the gallery was really very focused, uh, especially with Bud Leak, on landscape. And I became one of the uh, painters that he represented that are, you know, international artists of, of quite some acclaim. And I, I'm uh, very happy to be still considered a member of the gallery. It's a great honor. And it's, uh, uh, and then uh, I'm represented since the 90s uh, on the Eastern Shore with the Troika Gallery. So um, I'm in a very fortunate situation to have uh, you know, being able to kind of show my work. Uh, and, you know, I like the idea of the artist being local. I really like that idea. I mean, all artists are local. I mean, the Venetian school with Titian and Tintoretto, that was really with the kind of atmosphere and the kind of density of of change and, and the weather changes and everything that you get around Venice. And the artists around Florence is a different thing. And the artists are much drier you know, much smoother, less, you know, kind of interrupted by the fluency uh, and change of weather. It's a kind of a, much more with Raphael or uh, Piero del Francesco. It really comes out of that climate. And if you go to Europe, you know, uh, Eugene uh, Boudin, you know, it's really paints like uh, he's around the Havre and uh, he gets the kind of atmosphere of Normandy and the sea there. And Cezanne gets the atmosphere, of the red soil of Aix-en-Provence. So, I mean, artists are essentially local, even in New York artists. Like, uh, if you take uh, Essie's, the uh, photorealist, I mean, there's the celluloid wrap of New York City, the, the kind of, uh, or the kind of 
you know, the kind of uh, uh, the glamour uh, fixations of Alex Katz. So, I mean, the, if you look at the West Coast, you have Wayne Kibo very much uh, about a West Coast artist. And they used to be in jazz, you know, the, uh, Jerry Mulligan meets Monk. And Monk's an East Coast jazz musician <laughs> and Jerry Mulligan's West Coast. <laughs> and there's identity with all that. And I think all artists, so I liked, you know, I'm in the collection of uh, University of Maryland, uh, Uni University U College. U UMBC. And I, what I like about them is that they collect local Baltimore artists, yes. Maryland artists. I really love that. And what I liked about uh, Casas was the kind of support he gave to the local artists. And what I like about the Eastern Shore. So to me, you know, the idea of, uh, you know, the global universal artist, to me, that kind of takes away from the, the specificity and the authenticity and the relevance of the local artist, which is at the heart, I think, of great art. Well, Ro, one of your students is Laura, uh, who owns the Troika Gallery in Easton. And we have been fortunate to have you come to Easton to uh, participate in Plein Air, which is celebrating its 15th anniversary this year. So could you talk to us about your involvement uh, with the Troika Gallery and and then Plein Air in Easton? Well, there was a student at the Mountain Institute in the 60s that graduated and became a head of the Easton Academy. And his name was Robert Seifert. And he invited me down to do, I did a portrait of him in the academy. I did a portrait of Rob Seifert. And in the audience, I think it was Dorothy, uh, the mother of, of uh, Laura. And then Laura and Dorothy later, they became my students. We had classes actually in the, um, in the Eastern Academy, I think. I, I know, I taught there, you know, just, you know, like one or two day classes. And then I would do uh, plein air demonstrations uh, at different people, a group of plein air painters. And I would go to different sites outside of Easton along the Eastern Shore and do a, a demonstration. And then they started uh, a gallery and they had a gallery in a mall at first. And, uh, and then I contributed to that by doing portraits and then I did portraits also in front of their present uh, space on Harrison Street. And uh, so um, the gallery, you know, the Laura and, and her mother, Dorothy, they were, you know, they were very encouraging and uh, showed my work and it was great. I mean, it's been a great, uh, it's been great for me to have a, a gallery uh, that, it was so really totally sympathetic to the, my stance as an artist. And, uh, you know, so it went on all these years since I guess the very inception of their gallery, but it went on before when they were my students. And let me say both Dari and Laurie are incredibly talented artists. They're incredibly talented, both portraiture and landscape. And, um, you know, Dorothy was a real sweetheart that just passed from us recently. and. Uh, I think they're going to give her a show coming up soon. Nice. And uh, so it's been a very positive thing for me. <clears throat> I mean, a lot of times your relationship to a dealer is rancorous and, you know, and, you know, somehow be kind of a opportunistic ego of the artist is frustrated by the kind of the slackness of the dealer. But it wasn't the case in this gallery. There was a, a uh, wonderful give and take and a report that's going on for the years. Before before we close, could you tell us about the upcoming movie that's being made about you? Well, uh, one of my students, uh, uh, Maddie Becker, is to do a movie. She was a very good student, you know, of mine, and she went into movies. But her father actually studied with me in... I ran a, a landscape painting program. Here you go with the plein air. <laughs> I ran a, a landscape painting program for about three or four years in the Delaware Water Gap under the all spices of the Maryland Institute. And her father, uh, Maddie's father, the, 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 who's, Maddie was making the film about me, her father was my student 
from Yale, undergraduate Yale, and he was recommended to take courage by a, a wonderful painter, Gretna Campbell. She taught at Yale and recommended he study with me. So he encouraged her, I mean, as a student at Maryland Institute, and then she uh, decided to make, um, she would uh, risk her raw, uh, untutored talent on the, uh, on the uh, shifting prism of my identity. <laughs> and uh, we'll see how it turns out. She's still working on it. But it's been quite an experience. Well, thank you so much for sharing uh, the journey that you've been on and continue to be on to wrestle with life, to wrestle with your art, and to find uh, the expression that you continually express just as, as quickly as you can. Thank you. Well, it's my pleasure to be here.